Welcome to the Funnel Reboot Podcast, brought to you by Marketing What's New. Let's get into today's show. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot. Today, we're learning how to humanize our content. First, a quick PSA about Google shutting off Universal Analytics. The time for that is really close. So go check that you have Google Analytics 4 on your website so you'll keep getting data on visitors well into the future. All right, let's go to today's show. And regardless of when you're hearing this, it's safe to say that when you're on the internet, you're running into content generated by AI. And you may even be creating some of it yourself. There's a lot of good that chat functionality and AI-generated content brings us. But there's one thing that we want coming through in our content no matter what, and that is to sound human. What engages people is content with personality, content that evokes a response. And that's what today's guest will break down for us. When our guest found herself between jobs, her roommate's dad, who was an attorney, offered to give her some office tasks. One of the things was writing blog posts. She was more than happy to put her strong writing background to work for him. After six months, he came and told her that she had brought in $75,000 worth of business for his law firm, just from the blog posts that she had written. Well, that got her attention, and after a while, she started writing for an associate of his, and then for some friends. One thing led to another, and she ended up devoting herself to writing full-time, and she's never looked back. Her Chicago-based agency is called AV Writing Services, in which she produces content for clients with her dog, Bobby. Let's go talk to Allison Verhalen. I'm so glad to welcome Allison Verhalen. How's it going, Allison? It's going well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very glad to have you. We are here to talk about your book, Content Marketing Made Easy. Uh, When did it come out? Just a few months ago. I actually can't remember the publication date. I want to say May of this year, like late May. Sure. And we're talking in 2022 now. Right. Um, Yeah. Labor of Love, I'm sure. And it's uh, something that uh, you are writing about basically what you do day in and day out, which is writing. Yes. Writing and SEO. Right, because that's what everybody who writes wants to do in their spare time. More writing. <laughs> uh, but I think the point is made by you that no one, including yourself, is exempt from having to put their content out and let people find out what it is that they do. Even writers have to do that. Right. And to be honest, when I started, I was doing what I do for a while without having my own blog. And then it hit me that I couldn't tell people how important it was to have a blog if I didn't also have my own blog. And then I started writing ebooks for people and I was talking about how important that is. And I was like, well, I guess <laughs> I practice what I preach and write and publish a book. So <laughs> here we are. Yeah, exactly. So one of the things that I loved about the book was how you spoke about brand voice. And uh, this is a subject that a lot of people, uh, I think, gloss over or that is rather fuzzy for people. So maybe could you start off with just a really, really simple way that you like to describe to somebody who's never been, you know, really socked into content creation? What is brand voice? Yeah, I think of it as... Your, I mean, it's your branding, but it's the tone that you use, uh, it's the words that you use in your content. Obviously, we're all familiar with logos. There are tons of logos out there that we all recognize instantly. But if you take away the logo, will people still recognize your content as belonging to your brand? And if they are familiar with your brand, and if you have done a good job of strengthening that brand voice, then yes, they should absolutely be able to tell that that content belongs to your brand. Sure. So this is, I guess what we're doing is we're fleshing out uh, what all of our senses take in, right? The logo, as you say, that's the visual, right? Mm -hmm. So if our our sense of sight were taken away, the question is what else still falls under a brand? And of course, what we hear and what is in the written word 
is also a very big part of it. Um, you tell a great story. Could you maybe give us a, an example uh, that you give in the book that you're talking about a TV show and how brand voice, if we kind of imagine that a brand is like a person or a character, a fictional character, how can we think of brand voice that way? Right. So I was thinking about a TV show I was watching. It's my favorite TV show. And I was watching one of the extras where you have the writers and everyone talking about an episode while you're watching the episode. And one of the writers said they had been struggling with a bit of dialogue. And this particular show has really good dialogue. They talk about, you know, a character talking about one way and another character talking another way. You can really tell who a character is based on the way they talk. So that's the way your brand voice should be. It should be just as strong. So this one writer was saying they were struggling with the scene and they took a line that was originally assigned to one character and they assigned it to a different character. And when another writer read over it, they said that doesn't belong to that character. That belongs to this character over here. And they named the character that it was initially assigned to because the I don't know, I don't want to use branding, but the voice of each character was so strong that you could tell who's going to use what language, who's going to say what kind of line, even if the, the dialogue tag is not there or if it's mis, uh, misattributed. So your brand should be just that strong. It should be anyone who knows your brand should be able to tell right away that a piece of content belongs to you and not to one of your competitors. Yeah. So... Uh I love that. Um, I have my own kind of reference point for that, uh, also from TV, but uh, different era. Uh, for anybody who knows me, um, I'm a I'm a Star Trek fan. Um, I have all sorts of uh, things that I like. I like the Star Trek Next Generation, and I like Data and Lieutenant Commander Data in one episode. He he always talks a certain way, and another character on the show called him out uh, because. He was being impersonated. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't know this, but how the other character caught that was that Data used a contraction. He said, can't, not <laughs> cannot. He's an android, right? An android's right. not going to do, not going to make a mistake like that. So uh, I, I, I love how we can narrow down to very, very tiny things, like at a almost a syntax level of how we can speak. Um, but Maybe let's get a little broader here and, and, and just talk kind of in general terms of what kind of emotions or tones. Uh, what, what are the different tones that you think uh, a brand has to choose from? Oh, gosh, I really think they're limitless. Um, I come the conversation null tone gets a lot of talk because it is very very popular right now. People want that conversational tone and you can, you can be conversational and still find ways to distance your, you set yourself apart in the market, but there are, you could also take like a super professional tone. And um, I do have a client who refuses to let me use contractions, which I argue with, but you know what? The client is all right, always right. If they don't want contractions, then fine. We don't have to put that in there in their content, but for, all of my other clients, they get in there because it does sound very, very conversational. Sure. So and so on that conversational, like where you take me with that is I receive some email newsletters um, and some of them are trying, I can just tell they're trying to speak with me as if they're sitting across the table from me. Right. Is that what you mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And then I've got other ones and I'm thinking particularly of a, author that had a Kickstarter going on and Kickstarter lets them send out, you know, these broadcast messages and the style that that was written in. I'm not even sure how it was done because in English we have you singular and you plural, but kind of like y'all. Um, <laughs> and, and I could very much tell that it was like they were speaking in front of a whole room of people. Mm -hmm. That's just the way they carried it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so these are all different styles that if we don't think about it, we'll probably revert to just how we like to do it. Right. Absolutely. Yes. And that can be good because if we take, let's say a, um, a small business and there's a person who's our knowledge expert and who's delivering that professional service, then we want to hear them because when we eventually do business with them, 
we will come into personal contact with them and that scent trail will be continuous. It, we will not notice any difference since it'll all reinforce what we're thinking. Oh, I know, like, and trust this person because this is how they've sounded even from the first contact. Right. And especially for a lot of solopreneurs, we are our brand. So in that case, it absolutely makes sense to write like you talk, mostly. <laughs> a lot of yeah, right. There, There is always some cleanup that needs to be done when you're actually putting something onto paper or onto the screen, as the case may be. But yeah, you should absolutely write. Uh, yeah, your your brand voice should be your voice until you grow and maybe you want to do a rebrand. But yeah, that is how I work with a lot of my clients because a lot of them are solo printers. And so it, a lot of it is just getting to know them really well and how they talk and putting that into the content I create for them. Do you imagine that the type of business that they're in will sometimes narrow that list of tones? I'm thinking if you ran a funeral home, you might want to hit kind of on the somber notes. Right. Um, if, if you're like maybe a fast food chain like Wendy's, they're kind of n- notorious on their Twitter feed for mm-hmm. having this snarky, edgy mm-hmm. tone. Uh, like, like are there, I don't know, any rules of thumb for maybe how... Uh, it might make sense to lean one way or the other. Yeah. Well, like you said, knowing your industry, knowing your target audience is another one. Um, you know, snark can be great in some audiences and other people are going to be offended and, and put off by that. So know who your target audience is and know what they want to hear. Yeah. You call out specifically thinking, do you talk to baby boomers versus do you talk to millennials? Right. And further on, right? That there are going to be differences and you need to know what those differences are. Right. Um, When we look at the context for it, you also say that there's kind of a time and a place. um, and And I guess this is getting more into when you're talking about yourself, because this is where we absolutely need to speak with a single brand voice because we're talking about like if we're a solopreneur, we're actually talking about ourselves. Um, do you think that speaking about brand voice means that our own, not just our personality, but our personal life needs to be coming out in the brand? How do you guide people on do, you know, choosing to include or exclude that? Yeah, that is a personal choice. There's certainly a, an amount of how much of your personal life do you want to share, because it, it is the internet, it is available to everyone. So there's a security issue there, depending on how much you choose to share. But you can also talk about all kinds of things that happen in your life without any of it being a security risk, right? So, and again, it comes down to your personal choice. It comes down to your brand, your industry, your target audience. Do they want to hear you get super personal? And I mean, we mentioned boomers versus millennials a second ago. That's another big one where I think millennials absolutely want to know all about your life and your pets and your kids and your spouse and your vacation. Yes. Tell us all of that. Boomers, not so much. Excellent point. Yeah. Where it's just normal. right? Mm-hmm. So what are the norms in, in their area? I, I can't remember whether it was in the book or not, but there's this, tendency, especially among people who do marketing for a a job, to always try to paint the brand as if it were some shiny, happy person. And (laughs) and you kind of caution against that. Um, I I found the caution was really interesting. I hadn't thought of it. But you said that if you're doing that, and especially everybody else in your industry is doing that, then you're all going to sound somewhat the same. Right. Then you're not doing anything. gets back. Yeah, this gets back to what you were saying about if we pulled the logo off or if we swapped the logos. Right. right? Yeah, that too. I'm taking a moment talking about how you're managing in the world of GA4. To me, the new Google Analytics is more than just an interface. Its capabilities open up our entire funnel for analytical insights and for activating our marketing data. Now, most of you have installed GA4. That's great. To do this takes a bit more effort than that because you must configure GA4 with Google Cloud components, takes BigQuery, Looker Studio, services that API data back and forth, etc. 
And that's why I'm holding GA Fast Forward in-person events to do this over two days with people. A group of us work together to implement this new stack using our own company's marketing data. We come away with ready-made dashboards and AI-built audiences that we can leverage in our Google Ads. These workshops are running in Eastern Canada and across New York State, and soon in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts too. You can go now and see all the details by going to gafastforward.com, either with the number 4 in Fast Forward or all spelled out. Let's get back to the show. Should you just go to some other type of brand voice just because it sticks out and just because it will get noticed? Like, do we do that, you know, vanity? How, How far do we take this? It still has to be authentic. So if the shiny happy is part of who you are, then go for it. If that's not so much who you are, then you don't have to force yourself into a mold that you don't fit. And I don't think you should, because I don't think it's sustainable. And when we can't sustain a a particular brand voice, it's going to fall apart and you're going to start creating content that doesn't fit in line with that brand voice because you're forcing it. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Define your brand voice and and stick to it. Mm -hmm. It can play in your favor if you're a disruptive startup in a space, right? You very much want to have that. But if you are the longtime industry giant, um, first off, you don't need to. And as you say, it won't sound authentic. Right. Right. Like I think when any of us get a message from our cable company, you know, (laughs) who tell us that they're really on our side and (laughs) they're, they're trying to make massive changes because they really have our interests at heart. No, I don't think so. Yeah. No one's following. No. Um, we're going to talk about a few other things Um, I do want to get on to some of the interesting permutations about how this takes us into where we should write guest posts and what do we do when we have multiple marketers involved and how do they all sound the same. Uh, But we're going to take a very quick break for a PSA and then we're going to come right back. I'm taking a moment talking about how you're managing in the world of GA4. To me, the new Google Analytics is more than just an interface. Its capabilities are open up our entire funnel for analytical insights and for activating our marketing data. Now, most of you have installed GA4. That's great. To do this takes a bit more effort than that because you must configure GA4 with Google Cloud components, takes BigQuery, Looker Studio, services that API data back and forth, etc. And that's why I'm holding GA Fast Forward in-person events to do this over two days with people. A group of us work together to implement this new stack using our own company's marketing data. We come away with ready-made dashboards and AI-built audiences that we can leverage in our Google Ads. These workshops are running in Eastern Canada and across New York State and soon in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts too. You can go now and see all the details by going to gafastforward.com, either with the number four in Fast Forward or all spelled out. Let's get back to the show. Okay, we're back, Allison. And um, we were just talking about how brand voice uh, could be used when you have, let's say, more than one person who's doing the writing. Maybe you have an outside freelancer. Maybe there are several marketers on your team. Each of them has a piece of the website or some of them have some uh, blog articles and, you know, it's doled out round robin. Um, I'm wondering how we try to do this. Do you, are you a proponent of trying to get it written down? And, you know, the, the classic way that I know people who do writing get stuff like this down is a style guide, right? Mm -hmm. Um, There's, you know, Strunk and White, and the Chicago Manual, and I've got one here from Canadian Press. Do you, I mean, that's going maybe a bit far, but are you into having something where you can point to what the brand voice should be so that everybody understands it? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Because if you are bringing on outsiders, whether you're hiring a new one or, or hiring a freelancer, then absolutely it can help to just hand them a style guide instead of trying to explain how your content feels or making them dig through a ton of content that you already have to try and figure out on their own what your style guide is. If you can just write it down and give them a sheet of paper saying, here, this is our style guide. It makes things so much easier for them and for you. And it it eliminates that back and forth of, well, here I wrote a draft. Does this fit? No, you need to tweak this. Well, okay, here's the next draft. Does it fit? This fit. Well, it's closer, but you still need to, you know, tweak such and such. Oh, my. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you just have it all written out, you, you don't have to deal with that, that back and forth. And it makes it so much easier, especially like if something happens to your writer. Maybe you do have a writer that you love, but they get injured or they go on vacation or they leave for another job or whatever the case may be. Now, suddenly you're scrambling to retrain someone. You don't have to retrain them if you already have that style guide written out. Can you give any suggestions on what it might include? I mean, I know that a, an actual, like a journalist style guide is more like, well, here's how we use proper titles for people. And here's how we do our punctuation. You're going way broader than that, right? So right. maybe just give us maybe what a chapter heading in that thing might be so that get a feel for it. Right. And it can help to also decide, are you, you mentioned Chicago manual style. Are you following Chicago manual style? Are you following AP style? Because those are a little bit different. So it's not a bad idea to include that in there. But there's also a matter of what words are you using? We talked about contractions. Are you going to use contractions or are those banned from your content? Are you going to use things like super and awesome that are, you know, happy, but also super casual? Or are you going to keep it more professional? Are you going to use jargon? Is your audience someone who understands things like SEO and KPI and all those different acronyms? Or do you need to literally spell it out for them? So definitely keep those things in mind, uh, both in terms of what your audience understands, as well as, yeah, how do you want to position your brand? What words do you want associated with your brand? And then what words do you not want associated with your brand? What words are you going to say, nope, we are not using these? Yeah, it's that's it. It's including and excluding, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a really big one. And just to come back on that jargon one, one that I see all the time is business to business gets shortened either to B, the number two B, or B, and then the word T O, and then B. And if your own website has both of those on it, that's not mm -hmm. a good luck. Yeah, no, it's not. That's funny. I don't think I've ever seen the two spelled out. I've only ever seen it with the number two, I think. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe it could be a British English versus American English, right? And there's even that. We could even right. get specific down to which are we going to use. Right. Um, there's there's just so much in this that we can take away. Um, the, the branding, there's kind of two flavors to it. Um, as we do this kind of include and exclude, and we kind of go through exercises that can help us understand how to define our brand. Uh, one that you suggested, and I've taken you up on, is you play that old interviewer's question. Give me three words that describe you. Um, so those are kind of, that's a, that's a self thing. And then you even say, take it a step further put that down on one column of a table, but on the column next to it, try to put down words you imagine your competitor is using to describe themselves. I thought that was really good because when you're looking at the contrast of those two, you'll be able to notice some things you've never seen before. Right. And that's all about, again, positioning, making yourself stand out in the market. You want to make sure that you're not using the same words to describe yourself as you're using to describe competitors. And I had an exercise where I did this with a client once and we were using words to describe the competitors that then made her think of words to that she could use to describe herself. It helped her clarify and strengthen her own brand by thinking about how she's different from her competitors. Yeah. And, and it's a really nuanced difference, but the words that you use to describe yourself, like I think the three that I had for myself were, and they're, they're not necessarily positive or negative. They just are what they are. It's like a Myers-Briggs test. So I think I came up with rational, teacher-like, 
and plotting, right? So, and, and it doesn't matter. Like, plotting, I guess, is kind of negative, but <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't really matter because it's these aren't going to make it into your writing, but they are what help you have the state of mind of how that brand is to do that. So, for example, if you worked in a technology firm that's chock full of engineers, rational, plodding, you know, like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know about if you've got engineer friends, I have, and I yeah, come from fits. engineers, actually, <laughs> right? So, it, and like I said, we have to be careful uh, with, because we immediately want to censor, right? We want to um, have a, like, how do I want to be seen? Like we're in some kind of a, a dating scenario. That's not what this is. This is understand like which kind of animal you are in the zoo and embrace it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right? Um, you say that we should extend this to when we're thinking about getting into guest posting. Can mm-hmm. you tell me a little bit about how you like to approach looking at other publications to write for and you know why you think it's important? It's important because it's a great way to expand your visibility. It's also a great way to get backlinks to your website, which used to be great for SEO. Backlinks in general is great for SEO. Guest blogging is no longer a great way to get to boost your SEO. For some reason, Google decided they didn't like that strategy. No one knows why. Who knows why Google does what it does? But it gives you authority, right? Right. It gives you authority and it does still give you a link back to your website. So if people are finding you on this other website and they never would have found you, that link is not SEO juice, but it's still a workable link. If they want to find out more about you, they can still click through to that link and find out more about you. Now you have more traffic going to your website. And yeah, people know that you can write whatever on your website, right? But writing on another website, especially if it's someone that they respect and admire, you it's kind of like a gatekeeper. You had to get through that gate and convince them that you really know what you're talking about there. It's like they're vouching for you, right? It's like someone else, you know, recommending you for a job, right? Here, you should talk to this person. I vouched, you know, I, I cleared them. I know that they're they're good at what they do. You should listen to them. It makes a whole lot more of an impression than just, hey, listen to me talk about this because I know what I'm talking about because I say so, right? Everyone is going to take brings, that. It ball. brings into the equation the stage on which you are speaking and whether mm-hmm. that is a physical stage or, in this case, a virtual stage. You're being given the stage by somebody. Like you said, you you are, uh, you got a pass. Um, mm-hmm. So you must, you know, you, you are now not one of a big field. You're part of a narrow field of people who got a pass to have their stuff on there. How, right. how, how similar in tone should those publications be to what you are? Are you trying to go for the exact same kind? Um, I, I think what you're going to tell me is that you should absolutely keep your brand voice that you would use on your own website also in this guest post. But how do you factor it in when, that publication is a little bit different. Is that a good or a bad thing? Right. It is kind of a fine line because you are trying to brand yourself and your type, your name is going to go there at the top or the bottom, wherever they put the byline. So they're going to know it's not from whoever normally publishes blog posts. They know it's from a, an outsider, so to speak. So yeah. you have a little bit of flexibility with the voice, but you're still on someone else's stage and you're, you, you should still, they still expect a certain tone, certain types of content, they have certain expectations when they come to that website. So you have to meet those expectations. So the, and everyone is a little bit mm, different in terms sure. of what so they were. Maybe their, yeah, maybe their editors will go over your thing and maybe make some suggestions, but um, right. it, it doesn't sounds have- like you want to start from the way you talk. Right. Right. Yeah. So have have some elements of your brand in there, but also make sure that, like I said, you're meeting those expectations. Yeah. And that probably has to do with things like just length. Um, Mm -hmm. I guess if I go back to like print, you know, the length of an average article in the Wall Street Journal is a lot longer than the average length in USA Today. Mm -hmm. And the reading levels are different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the amount of depth you can get into because of the length of writing is different. So Mm -hmm. 
you know, you, you kind of have to bring those factors into play and you Absolutely. have to understand, okay, this is going in the wall street journal. You know, I'm, I am going to need to maybe drill into my arguments and reasons a little more. This is not going into USA today. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the ones where we see, if I could point out, you know, the fails for those, it's those things that are called advertorials and advertorials to me, that's when a company just writes a boilerplate ad. It's very thinly disguised as a article. And then they slam it into 20 different publications all over the place. Mm -hmm. Um, And whether, whether this is on print or, online. I don't know about you, but to me, it sticks out like a sore thumb. I, mm-hmm. I just want to move on. I don't even want to look at it. Right. So we don't want those mistakes. We want, we want to be able to do it um, in the right way. Um, would you even think it's okay to pass on a couple of publications if they are just not at all the same kind of tone and they would not be a good fit for you? Yeah, absolutely be strategic about who you're partnering with, with those guest blog posts, because it is time and effort, or if you're hiring someone like me to write it, right, that's you know, money you're investing into it. So is it, are you going to get a return on that investment? Does it make sense to partner with this particular publication or industry or, you know, whoever it is that, uh, that is, has approached you? Does it make sense? Is it is it going to get you in front of the right people? Is it going to help position you as an authority? Or is it just busy work? I know you've got uh, a sense for how you pitch these things. And for you, uh, it, it came through very clear in the book that you want us to spend a disproportionate t- amount of time on our headline, right? Because you say that the way that you are setting up a piece, whether it's just to pitch it, to go into a guest uh, placement or you're actually writing it for the audience, you say spend more time on the headline than just the few words that it is, right? 100%. How, how do we do that? What are good, some good suggestions for making a headline that is SEO friendly, that you know will get the person at the other end to continue reading? What are some good tips? Yeah, so I had came across a poll on, I think it was on LinkedIn of, you know, do you write the headline first or last or somewhere in the middle? And I was like, kind of first and last, because I, I do tend to start with a topic. So I start with my keyword and your target keyword has to be in the title. So that's step one is make sure that your target keyword is in the title. Google reads the title and the subheadings before it reads the rest of your content. So that's kind of an alert to Google about what your content is really about and your audience, right? They want to know what it's about. So if they're searching something and your headline comes up and their keyword isn't in your headline, they're going to wonder why you popped up and if you're still relevant. You also want to make sure that your content like you said, delivers on its promise. Your headline is making a promise of what people are going to get in the content. So deliver on that promise. Don't create clickbait that promises them three ways to lose weight and then talk about something completely unrelated because, ha, it tricks you. You're on my website. Now you have to read this or or watch this video. They don't have to read or watch anything. If it's not relevant, they're going to bounce back. And Google is going to notice that bounce rate. And that higher bounce rate does not look good. So right. I'll resist that. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, don't try to trick people. That can backfire real fast. Um, and, yeah. You also I, say, you, I'm sorry, but you say that you want us to think of ourselves as if we're a solution for something. We're treating them like we're a doctor or a coach. So you say don't start with, like, launching into that treatment. Mm-hmm. Go a step backward to the pain that they're experiencing, Mm -hmm. right? And so do you think that we should mention the pain in the headline? I think you can go either way. I mean, most keywords are a pain point or they're hinting at a pain point, right? That's why we search something on Google in the first place, right? It's because we have a problem and we're looking for a solution. So that's going to be your first key is you know, are they, are they looking for a solution? Um, and yeah, you have to 
demonstrate that you understand what the pain point is and how much it hurts and and how much worse it can get before you can convince them that okay you really know what you're what I'm going through now I trust you now I can read the rest of this content or watch the video right. or whatever it may be right and you would suggest that very shortly after that uh, you start explaining at least hinting at the solution so mm -hmm. you know we're, we're talking in the first maybe, couple of sentences, maybe even short enough that if we're in a search result, that it might begin to show in the snippet, you know, what, what it is that we're saying you could do about that. Right. Yeah. And again, we can infuse a little bit of our brand voice when we do that. That's, Absolutely. that's half the fun. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Allison, there's a lot more in the book. We didn't get time to chat about it, but if people want to find out where to get the book or they want to find about your services, where can they go? So the book is on Amazon print and ebook. It is content marketing made easy by me, Alison Verhalen. Um, the website that I am at is a V as in my initials, Alison Verhalen. So that's easy to remember. It is a V writing services.com. And you can also find out more about the book on there. There is also a free companion workbook to go along with the book that is also there on my website. So you can go there to check that out. Yeah. And I'll have links to, um, all of that in the show notes. Yeah. The workbook, we didn't touch on that, but it's a, a good way of just stopping. I mean, you encourage someone as they're going through this to set the book down, but it's even easier with the workbook because right there is the spot where you can just go ahead and have it. And if I'm correct, people don't have to buy the workbook, right? No workbook is free. It's a free PDF download that you can get from my website. So, yep. Fantastic. Allison, thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. I know that people got a lot of value out of it. And my hope is that this gave them better insights that they can use to help them make their funnel even better. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.